joining us today. My name is Tony Eld and I'm the Director of the National Gallery of Victoria. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this live virtual curatorial tour of the NGV's Melbourne Winter Masterpieces exhibition, French Impressionism from the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. I will start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the land on which the NGV is built, the Wurundjeri and the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. We know that many of you weren't able to visit French Impressionism from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston due to our temporary closure, so we're very excited to be able to launch this exclusive virtual tour for you today. We'll be joined by NGV's Senior Curator of International Art, Dr Ted Gott, and our Senior Curator of International Exhibition Projects, Dr Miranda Wallace, who will guide you on this curatorial tour. This is one of the most comprehensive exhibitions on the subject of French Impressionism ever presented in Australia, and it charts the full trajectory of this important art movement with great nuance, beauty, and also depth. It features many wonderful masterpieces by the likes of Claude Monet, Auguste Renoir, Edgar Degas, Camille Pissarro, Mary Cassatt, and many more. It's been an absolute privilege to have access to the MFA Boston's rich collection, which is especially known for being one of the most important collections of French Impressionists anywhere in the world. So we're delighted to be able to share this with you virtually today. Before I hand over to Ted Miranda, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for your generous support of the NGV and also thank our corporate partners about whom this exhibition would not be possible. We're also very grateful for the generosity and time and expertise of the staff in Boston, especially their curator of paintings, Katie Hansen, and their assistant curator, Julia Welch. So thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the tour. Hello, I'm Miranda Wallace. I'm Senior Curator of International Exhibition Projects at the NGV, and today, my colleague, Ted Gott, who's a Senior Curator of International Art at the NGV, and I will be taking you on a virtual tour of French Impressionism from the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. So many of you I know were unable to visit French Impressionism from the Muse Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, due to our temporary closure. So we're excited to launch our virtual online tour with you today. Please leave any questions that you may have in the comments section and we'll do our best to answer them. We're going to go on a tour today using this wonderful new technology that enables us to see our galleries in 3D virtual renders uh, that really help transport us into the space and to see these uh, paintings in the exhibition galleries as we've displayed it. So we're going to start off with French Impressionism uh, and an introduction to the movement. This was a movement that uh, is actually quite hard to define, but is um, often associated with a group of young artists who um, launched their own independent exhibition series in 1874. And they did this because they wanted to create a new way of showing their work that was distinct from the system of art exhibitions that had been in place up until that time, which was imposed by the French state, known as the Salon, the annual exhibition that was juried by a group of academic painters and was really very tightly controlled in terms of subject matters and um, who, who would become successful. The critical responses to these salons were very um, make or break in terms of young artists, and there wasn't much freedom for expression. So this young group of artists who were observing all of the change in the world around them, wanted to change the way art was experienced. They wanted to change what they could paint. And so they held these independent exhibitions that really, um, when you look at the works that were exhibited, there was a great deal of variation in terms of style and content, but the idea of change and of shaking up the establishment was one of the, certainly one of the unifying elements. Another great characteristic of Impressionism that I think creates this, this idea of a movement was this uh, ambition to paint nature in a way that was more true to the experience of nature before uh, before them. So these artists painted what the uh, painted um, often outdoors. They the French call it en plein air in the open air, and they were taking advantage in doing this uh, of new technologies that enabled them to take paints now uh, recently uh, enabled able to be uh, packaged in metal tubes. They could take these metal tubes and their portable easels out into the landscape and paint in front of the motif, in front of the scenes that they wanted to capture rather than in the much, you know, in the more artificial environment, if you like, of their studios and painting using references of other images or from their imagination. This was really about transcribing the real world. And that was quite a revolutionary thing to be doing at this time in the history of art. We're going to start with this pair of paintings, which really exemplify the uh, Impressionism at its 
high point, in, if you like, in the mid-1870s. On the left, we have a painting by Claude Monet, which is called Meadow with Poplars. And it's this very beautiful, radiant landscape that um, shows some of the more, um, the characteristics of, of Monet's aesthetic, his individual vision. Uh, you see here this glorious landscape in the foreground, a field of grasses dotted with wildflowers, including poppies, which are a recurring motif in many of uh, Monet's paintings. These vertical poplars, which create this wonderful comp compositional form to the image. Uh, a little figure is glimpsed in the in the sort of middle foreground. And in the distance, there are the, the shape of haystacks, which will become such an iconic motif in late uh, Monet, in, late in Monet's career. This scene of France that Monet captures, like many of his paintings, really captures something of the atmosphere of the landscape, which is something that we will see through the exhibition Monet aspiring to capture in his paintings. This painting was is, is shown side by side with an, a work by another wonderful painter, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, but it's a very different looking work. And if we just focus on, first of all, the composition we have here occupying almost the entire canvas, the figure of a woman. And in, in fact, this is thought to be Camille Monet, uh, Claude's wife. And it's believed that the painting was made during one of uh, Renoir's many visits to Monet. They were close friends. They met at art school. They went on several painting uh, journeys together and often were painting side by side. Renoir has a very different painting technique from Monet. So there's quite a different uh, aesthetic here, much more feathery brushworks. And if you think about the way this grassy hillside behind the figure is is depicted. It's really quite extraordinary. You can see this, the sort of bright, almost, you know, the chrome yellow and these emerald greens, fairly new pigments in terms of um, the history of paint creation. They're new pigments that artists were enjoying experimenting with. They had such bright vibrancy. There's also this, this sort of choppy look to the, the brush, the brush strokes, which is the feathery uh, work that Renoir becomes so well known for. So these two paintings introduce us to some of those key characteristics of Impressionism. But what the exhibition also enables us to do, and in the first gallery of the show, we we're going to be introduced to the kind of painting that was being made in the decades immediately before Impressionism. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ted, to take us back in time. Ted. Thanks very much, Miranda. Now, the opening galleries of this exhibition actually take us back in time to look at where Impressionism came from. And this very first opening gallery, which has been designed to evoke a sense of walking into a forest with these columns of trees, uh, takes us to the forest of Fontainebleau. This was a popular tourist destination uh, that was located just over 50 kilometres from Paris. And with the addition of railway access at mid-century, the 1850s onwards, this celebrated forest was just an hour's journey from the capital. It became a real destination for both tourists and artists alike. This opening gallery looks at the works of art that first inspired the Impressionists when they were teenagers. And these were the works created in this forest from the 1830s through to the 1850s by a generation of artists who were known as the School of Barbizon. And that's because these artists came to paint at Fontainebleau. They stayed together in a little collective in a tiny village on the edge of the forest called Barbizon. So they're known as the Barbizon artists. This is a classic one by one of the most famed of the school, an artist called Narcisse Vigil Diaz de la Peña. And he painted moody forest views throughout his career, like this one, using very dense and thickly applied paint. There's a great story attached to this artist and the development of Impressionism. And the story goes that in 1863, Diaz was in the Fontainebleau Forest, painting a scene just like this one. And he saw a man, a young man, very poorly dressed, struggling to create a landscape composition, not doing very well. So he went up, introduced himself, gave him his first uh, impromptu painting lesson and discovered that the young man's name was Pierre-Auguste Renoir. It is, of course, the future great Impressionist painter. Renoir never forgot meeting Diaz and getting these great tips on how to mix paint and blend colours in the middle of the forest, and he forever called him his grand homme, his great hero. Now, the story goes that taking pity on the impoverished young man, when he'd finished for the day, Diaz forgot to take home with him 
his paints and his brushes. He realized that Renoir was so poor, he couldn't afford proper painting materials, so he left them for him. Later on, we know that Diaz opened an account at his art supply shop in Paris in the name of Renoir and paid for his material. So it's a great story of one generation of artists, the first generation to paint out of doors before nature, passing the baton and the lesson of that onto the upcoming generation. Now, if we move across to the left slightly, we see how direct observation from nature and painting directly before nature in the forests and clearings, again, of Fontainebleau, also lay at the heart of another artist. And this is a man called Théodore Rousseau. He preferred to stay in Fontainebleau or in the village of Barbizon from autumn through to spring. He hated the summer when it was full of tourists. So most of his paintings are done in wintry and autumnal colors. And he was renowned for his mastery of this intense palette of browns and dark greens. He's also an important artist because he was responsible for a conservation effort that saved large parts of this forest from destruction at this time. Rousseau noticed that even as he was painting the beauty of Fontainebleau, large parts of its forests were being clear felled and many of its rocky outcrops were being quarried. Uh, this was to provide the wood and the stone for the reconstruction of Paris that began in the late 1850s under Emperor Napoleon III, which Miranda will tell us about later on in the exhibition. If we go to the left of this work, we see a remarkable painting uh, the second painting by Claude Monet in the exhibition, but the earliest one. This is a beautiful scene painted in 1863 when Monet, having admired Rousseau's work, we know that he saw it at the Salon of 1859. He wrote home to his family about how fantastic Rousseau's paintings were. And in 1863, he comes himself to this forest and paints this work directly before nature. And I think you can see here both his choice of subject matter and his darker color palette clearly reflect the earlier work of Theodore Rousseau. So we see the baton being handed on. We see this dialogue between an earlier generation and the young Impressionists from their teenage years onwards as we walk into the next gallery of the exhibition, which is devoted to an artist <clears throat> not so well known here in Australia, although we do have two of his paintings in the NGV collection. And this is a man called Eugène Boudin. Like Monet, he lived in La Havre in Normandy in the 1850s. And we know there that um, in the late 1850s, uh, when Monet was still a teenager, he was seen by Boudin drawing caricatures of citizens of the town to earn a few bucks. Boudin uh, went up and introduced himself. Uh, he was 16 years older than Monet, so he straight away took on a mentorship uh, role. He said, you can clearly do better than these caricatures. Why don't you come out with me and I'll show you how to paint directly before nature. So he takes him to the beach at La Havre. He shows him how he gives him a paint and a canvas and shows him how to paint the sea and sky. From this point on, Monet abandoned his caricature drawings completely and devoted himself to painting and primarily landscape painting for the rest of his life. He later proclaimed that um, he learned to, to appreciate the sea, the light, the blue sky from Boudin, and he said to the end of his life, Monet said, without Boudin, there would have been no Claude Monet. I owe everything to him. Now, like um, Diaz supporting Renoir with providing painting supplies with him, Boudin supported Monet so much that he showed alongside him and his young colleagues in the very first group Impressionist show in 1874, the older generation joining the new in the landmark first group exhibition of independent painting, as it was then called. Thanks, Ted. And I, one thing that's so great in this uh, room of the exhibition and that we can sort of appreciate uh, it, in the story of Impressionism it comes from the fact that the MFA Boston's collection uh, was largely uh, formed through art that had been bought by the uh, Bostonians travelling in France in the 1850s and 60s, if not a little before, and many of them wanted to collect contemporary art and many of them were collecting the art of the Barbizon painters and indeed Eugène Boudin, which is why we are able to have 13 of these beautiful paintings by Boudin in the exhibition. This is what the last work by Boudin, and we're just going to pause on this before going into the next gallery. It's a painting in Venice. You can see here the City of Water, uh, one of the paintings that Boudin painted when he first travelled to Venice at the age of 68. Um, it's from 1895, and it shows the church of Santa Maria della Salute uh, from San Giorgio. 
the subject of water, as Ted's explained, was you know fundamental to Boudin's practice. The meeting of sea and sky, whether it's the coasts of Normandy, sometimes the south of France and here Venice, the kind of capturing of these atmospheric effects, the changing nature of, of weather on in these beautiful scenes um, of the outdoors was something that Boudin uh, valued and passed on to Monet. And so the next painting we're going to look at is a, is a work by Monet, who is really a consistent hero throughout our exhibition. Um, having seen that early work in the Barbizon room, we're now going to see the painting that's actually the, the latest painting in his career um, in the exhibition. It's from 1908. And it's a painting also of Venice, also of Santa Maria della Salute, the church in Venice. And it's uh, and quite an extraordinary one, as you can see, and one that I think you immediately can identify as Monet. And what are the what are the characteristics that make it Monet? It has a much more, um, I think, loosely uh, loosely textured surface, encapsulating the reflections on this on the water in the foreground. This is a painting that Monet made. Uh, he made many, many visits to Venice, but he made a visit to, in 1908. Um, previously, he had always said in his, there's evidence in a letter to his wife that he wrote, he said that Venice was too beautiful a city to, to paint. So he actually didn't paint it until he was quite old uh, in 1908. And he painted it over 30 paintings on that particular visit. And this is one of them. And it's a really uh, masterful work. You can see this capturing of the, the pinks and the lilacs with the yellows. The water in the foreground is almost as important, you might say, as the, you know, the wonderful sort of monument that's in the, in the middle ground there of the church. And the light, perhaps we can imagine it's the setting sun capturing some of the building and some of the poles for the gondolieri there. Um, what I think you can see in this painting is, is why the, uh, um, the artist Edouard Manet dubbed Monet the Raphael of water because he was so uh, masterful at his painting of this substance. But this room of the exhibition actually allows us to see many artists' approach to painting water. It's a consistent theme in uh, Impressionist painting. And uh, the curator in Boston who's worked with us on this exhibition, Dr. Katie Hansen, wanted to particularly draw out the um, the profusion of paintings in their collection that feature water and has painted in so many different ways. This is a room where we get to see three marvellous paintings by Alfred Sisley, another great Impressionist who um, is perhaps less known uh, I mean, he's certainly greatly celebrated, but I think perhaps less known for the fact that he painted largely landscapes alone. He did some still life, but he didn't tend to branch out into much figure painting or other genres of art. And he actually consistently painted scenes of the of the um, the, the tributary of the uh, Seine River uh, near which he lived to the west of Paris um, from the 1870s onwards. And he painted over 300 canvases just of his sort of surrounding, uh, the surrounding countryside. The first, the, the painting that we'll focus in on is a work called Waterworks at Mali. And um, it's a beautiful painting that I think shows the way these artists approached water and sky, and particularly clouds, as quite distinct in terms of the way they use their brush strokes. The clouds have a much softer, more feathery kind of texture to them, whereas the water, you can see these little dabs of paint that really help to create the reflections and the that mirror-like effect, but also the diffusion of light on the surface. It's interesting to note that the building in this painting, the, on the left there, is actually a, a pump house. It, was, it houses the pumps that are used to pump water to the fountains at Versailles. So it's not a, you know, a, picturesque crumbling ruin. It's actually quite a, an industrial building at, of the time. And one thing that Sisley didn't shy away from was the evidence of these water, these rivers as working rivers. There are barges. You can see aqueducts with the railway going across them. So it's certainly presenting landscape as it was before his very eyes. Now, the last painting we'll look at in this gallery before we move to the subject of still life is a painting by another artist who is often actually associated less with Impressionism than with post-Impressionism because his practice is really very singular and kind of hard to define. It's it's not uh, solely a, a painting about experience. It's also a very conceptual practice. This is Paul Cezanne and his painting The Pond. It's a very unusual painting if you consider, if you look at it for a long time and you think, 
the, the figures on the riverbank there all seem to have slightly different proportions as if they're painted from different vantage points. Um, and I think that uh, Cezanne probably moved around while he was painting this to capture the scene. He um, was notoriously slow as a painter. And I think in the case of this um, particular subject matter, he was probably experimenting a little bit with where he um, where he was seated. He actually is, uh, he made a note uh, when he was working by the riverbank, which I'll read. Um, he said, here, by the riverbank, the motifs multiply. The same subject seen from a different angle offers a subject for study of the greatest interest and so varied that I think I could keep myself busy for months without shifting my position, inkling sometimes more to the right, sometimes more to the left. This very close study of the world, which is reflected in this painting, is something that you also see in Cezanne's still life, which is where we're going to travel to next in our tour. The next gallery is devoted to the subject of still life. And having seen so many landscapes up to this point, you know, it's a useful reminder of the fact that these artists didn't uh, solely paint landscapes, nor did they solely paint out of doors. There were many months especially in, you know, France in the winter where it was cold and rainy and they probably didn't want to uh, be painting outdoors. They wanted the warmth of their studio, but also they wanted to practice uh, a genre that was something that has a very distinguished and important history in um, the history of painting, but also a, a, something that enabled them to sell these more domestic scaled paintings that were often more popular in the market and would be something that could help, you know, keep a sort of steady source of income. Cezanne elevates the subject of still life to something else, um, and he really does use it as a, a kind of exercise in painting and trying to understand how to represent the world. And you get, you know, a sense of the sort of philosophical sort of ramifications of his practice when you consider his approach to these more sculptural forms. Uh, you can see him trying to work out the spatiality of these uh, the objects that he's looking at within a, on a two-dimensional surface, but he does create this very much an illusion of three dimensions. He's thinking of the plane of the tablecloth and of the cloth in the background, and very much thinking about the the forms of the jug and the fruit. Cezanne was less um, keen on painting flowers. He um, was, an, as I mentioned, a very slow painter, and he found that uh, flowers were unreliable in the fact that they wilted too quickly. He said. Fruits are much more reliable. They love having their portraits done. <laughs> and so you can see in many of his works the, you know, repeated forms of apples, pears, oranges and lemons like here. The Cezanne is one of the more experimental uh, still life in this room alongside two others which we'll look at um, before I hand back to Ted. But the, the next one in this um Room is the Kaibot by Gustav Kaibot, an, an, an artist who was very integral to the Impressionist movement. He was uh, an artist who was uh, an independently wealthy artist who was able to be very supportive of his friends, the Impressionist painters, and he amassed his own quite significant collection of Impressionist works throughout his fairly short life. Um, many of his works were later um, accepted into the French museum's collections and they're, all, and they're now in the Musée d'Orsay or um, other, other French museums. This is a fabulous um, still life that is effectively, I mean, I think that you can see connections here to the kind of almost a photographic sensibility and the, the idea that he's really capturing here a composition that's been created by a market seller who's displayed his fruit on a stand in a very upmarket part of France, and it's a very expensive looking fruit stand. And Kaibot, um, you know, was described by a critic of the time as a millionaire who paints in his spare time, which I think is a rather dismissive way of putting it. He was an extremely good painter, as you can see. But I think the um, the connection that we can make here is that you know the part of Paris where Kaibot lived had very beautiful fruit stores, fruit seller, fruit selling stands, and he's captured it here you know, almost as if he's let the, he's done it as a collaboration, if you like, with the, uh, the, the seller of the fruit. The last still life in this uh, section that we'll pause at is, the, is uh, by one of the two female artists in the exhibition, Berthe Morisot, Morisot and she uh, was what, a really important member of the Impressionist group. She exhibited in all but one of the Impressionist exhibitions. She was 
um, from a fairly upper class family. And at the time, women were not allowed into the official art schools to study art, but she managed to get a very good art education. She and her sister were taught by independent, given sort of independent lessons. And she was at one point, in fact, taught by Coro, one of the Barbizon painters. Um, she developed a very uh, idiosyncratic painting style, you might say. And this is a quite a an interesting example of that, this very sketched appearance of the paint that almost appears in certain er in certain lights to be an unfinished work. However, it is a signed painting. And I think the front section of it, where you see the fold in the tablecloth or the edge of the table, perhaps, you know, you can get a sense of the planes, but you also get a sense of her perhaps stopping the painting process when she feels she's captured the scene, which is, I think, what her ambition was in this um, particular painting. Um, we, it's the only painting in the Museum of Fine Arts um, collection by Morisot, so we're very pleased to have it in our exhibition. Um, and we're going to pass, I think, um, to I'll pass to Ted to talk a little bit more about Morisot before we move to look at Renoir in the next gallery. Thanks, Miranda. Yes, uh, look, like um, Kayabot, uh, Berta Morisot was independently wealthy, so she didn't need to sell her paintings. She exhibited them more to get official recognition of her talent as an artist, and her independence financially is believed to have encouraged her to be so highly daring and experimental. And the critics in her lifetime were very divided. We know because there are hundreds of reviews that survive in the contemporary newspapers. So she had her defenders like Jules Antoine Castagnari, who wrote uh, reviewing one of the shows where she exhibited that there is only one true impressionist in this exhibition, and that is Mademoiselle Berta Morisot. She also had her detractors, and there is review after review in the 1870s and 1880s that attacks her, that says, look, this artist clearly has talent, but why on earth can't she finish anything? And one notorious reviewer wrote that the reason why Berta Morisot can't finish a picture is because she is a woman. And of course, you know that women can't concentrate enough to finish anything. So she suffered from the uh, misogyny and, and patriarchy of the system. But nonetheless, she was highly successful. She sold well. And she knew before her untimely death in 1895 that she was one of the greatest contemporary painters working in France. And so we are delighted that this year, in conjunction with holding this great exhibition from the MFA Boston, the NGV has been able to acquire our very first painting by Berthe Morisot. This is in fact the first painting by a woman impressionist to enter the NGV's collection, and it's the first painting by Berthe Morisot to enter any public collection in Australia. Now, Miranda mentioned that there was one show out of the eight group exhibitions that the Impressionists held in Paris between 1874 and 1886 that Berta Morisot missed. And that was 1879 because she was recovering from the birth of her daughter, Julie. And Julie is the subject of this painting. We see in this beautiful work painted in 1889, it's called La Broderie or Embroidery. We see on the left, uh, Julie in the blue dress, uh, and she is working on a piece of embroidery with her older, uh, cousin Alice, who's seated on the right. There's a marvellous parrot in the background, if you look closely, providing a little musical grace note to this glorious composition. So we'd like to thank everyone who has helped uh, by contributing to the funds to acquire this remarkable new painting for the NGV, which you will see on display. It'll be on permanent display in our dedicated French Impressionism Gallery on the second level of NGV International when we reopen. So that's something really to look forward to. Now, the next gallery takes us into a large space that our exhibition designers have cut into two with a kind of a viewing channel, as you can see briefly here, between the two halves. And this is the deliberate design conceit that talks about how uh, the Impressionists were constantly looking over their shoulders at one another, both encouraging and also being spurred by um, a, a sense of artistic rivalry, as it were. And the first half of this room looks at the work of Pierre Auguste Renoir. Now we saw earlier on when he was painting in uh, Fontainebleau in 1863, how Diaz took pity on him, seeing what a poor man he was. He did come from a very poor family. He was the son of a tailor and a seamstress. They couldn't afford to keep him in school. So at the age of 13, he was sent to work in a porcelain factory where his job was to paint copies of 18th century French paintings onto cups and saucers. 
He began sneaking away to the Louvre on weekends to study the old masters. And also in his late teens, he did go to um, art school for a while where he met Claude Monet and they became lifelong friends. But he always felt that he wasn't as well trained as his other impressionist colleagues. And because he felt so inadequate in 1881, he traveled to Italy. And he traveled there with the express intention of studying the great Renaissance works by Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. He wanted to master the human figure. But also while there, he painted remarkable views like this extraordinary scene of Venice. It's very like the Monet that Miranda uh, described for us just a few moments ago. Its subject is less architectural details of the glory of Venice than it is simply the movement of light on water, um, clouds and sky. And there's an absolute rainbow symphony of colours in the glittering waters of the canal in the foreground. I don't know why looking at a work like this, Renoir felt he was inadequate at all. Be that as it may, he studies the works of the great Renaissance masters, then he comes back to Paris and in 1883, as we see on the other side of this gallery, he unveils a group of over life-size paintings that depict amorous young couples dancing in a beer hall at Bougival on the outskirts of Paris on a gorgeous spring or summer's day. And with these monumental figure works, Monet showed to the world, to his Impressionist colleagues, but most importantly to himself, that he was the equal of any of them, that he could master the human figure just as well as uh, Monet or Pissarro or Sisley indeed. So the other side of the gallery looks in at his colleague Camille Pissarro, and Pissarro was the oldest of the Impressionist artists. And because of that difference in age, he took on a natural mentorship role. Now, Pissarro and his uh, wife, Julie, had over a 20 year period, eight children, seven of whom survived into adulthood. So they simply couldn't afford to live in Paris. They couldn't afford an apartment for nine people, two, uh, two adults and seven kids. So for most of his career, Pissarro, although he traveled back and forth to Paris, because remember there are the railways, so he's only 40 minutes away. Uh, he lived in uh, a little country town called Pontoise. And this beautiful scene here is painted in 1874, the year of the first group impressionist show. And it shows a little area on the outskirts of the town. This is one of the uh, paintings that Pissarro called his quack, his corners. And he loved to paint the outskirts where the, where the country meets city. And it's a glorious painting of uh, a lush summer's day filled with uh, yellow sunlight, absolutely glorious. He painted over 300 views like this of Pontoise, a village in which he lived for close to 20 years from the 1860s through, through to the early 1880s. And it was at Pontoise that he welcomed younger colleagues. If we go to the next painting in this gallery, we meet another great work by Paul Cezanne. Now, Pissarro had first met Cezanne in 1861 when Cezanne was still at art school. Uh, Pissarro was nine years older and he felt that Cezanne was being picked on in art school. Uh, Cezanne came from the south of France, from Aix-en-Provence, and he had a very strong Provencal accent. Uh, and Pissarro bonded with him because Pissarro came from the Danish West Indies and he had a foreign accent with speaking French as well. So this sense of otherness drew the two together as friends. And then the friendship developed into one of a real teaching partnership. Um, Cezanne uh, invited, uh, sorry, Pissarro invited Cezanne to come and stay with him and his family at Pontoise. And they would spend many weekends together uh, painting outdoors these great quant or corners of the city that Pissarro loved so much. And in um, the summer of 1881, Cezanne actually moved to Pontoise to be even closer to Pissarro. And that's where he painted this beautiful painting. So just imagine that Pissarro is there alongside him, has also got an easel and a canvas, and they're painting exactly the same scene. But of course, being independent painters, they're painting uh, in two completely different uh, brushstroke or handwriting styles, as it were. This is one of the glories of Impressionism, that it's it's not everything being cookie cutter like. Um, the rules of the salon that they were breaking that required artists to paint works that looked identical. It was hard to tell who the individual artist was. That's out the window now. And we have unique um, emotional responses and unique visual responses to nature. And we can tell at a glance now whether a painting is by a Pissarro or Renoir or Monet. 
um, their work is is um, absolutely definable. Um, and that's one of the things we love about this movement. The next painting along shows us an artist who, for many of us, is better known for the symbolist works he painted in Brittany um, in the later 1880s, and then for the highly exotic works he painted in Tahiti and the Marquesas in the 1890s, and early 1900s, and that is Paul Gauguin. But what this painting does is remind us that Gauguin started out as an impressionist painter. He, in fact, started out, uh, first of all, as, a, as a, a sailor in the Merchant Marine. Then he discovered that he was a financial wizard. And so in the uh, 1870s, he's working as a stockbroker in Paris. He visits the first impressionist shows and he starts to buy the paintings of Pissarro. When Pissarro discovers that this financial uh, stock wizard uh, owns seven of his paintings, he introduces himself to the collector and then discovers to his amazement that um, Gauguin has aspiration to be a painter himself. So like Cezanne, Pissarro invites Gauguin to come and stay with him um, in the Pontoise and to paint alongside him. And here's another great example of that baton being passed from one to another. This time it's not the generation shift as we saw in the first gallery from the 1850s to the teenage impressionist. It's from the oldest impressionist to the newest member of the group, Paul Gauguin. And Gauguin did show in three of the group impressionist shows before changing his style completely, uh, but that's in the future. If we go to the next painting in this room, we see the most remarkable mentorship that Pissarro provided, and um, that's to the young man uh, who was Vincent van Gogh. Now, Van Gogh started out painting very dark and moody landscapes um, in Holland, his native Holland, um, and he was sending those down to Paris to his brother Theo uh, in that expectation of sales. And we know from the extensive correspondence that Theo could not sell these dark paintings. And Theo himself um, is now already a dealer selling works by Monet and Pissarro, ironically. So he writes to his brother and says, please come to Paris. I can't sell your dark works. Please come here. Have you heard of these people called the Impressionists? Can you get some colour into your work? So in February 1886, Van Gogh famously arrives in Paris. The scales fall from his eyes. He sees the eighth and last group Impressionist exhibition, and he also sees the great retrospective of the work of Claude Monet, um, or Claude Monet's work up to that date that, ha that is held at the Georges Petit Gallery in Paris. And his art is transformed. He brings in color, he brings in a new way of painting. And then in, he moves, as you know, to the south of France, where in just 18 months in an incandescent period, he paints almost every famous uh, Van Gogh painting that we know today. Then in May 1890, after his incredibly creative time in the south of France, he moves north for his mental health. And he and on Camille Pissarro's advice, he moves to Auvers, northwest of the capital, to the village of Auvers that's close to where Pissarro is living. So there's a clear sense here that this painting done in 1890 by Van Gogh, which is called Houses at Auvers, is a clear nod to the many views of Pontoise painted previously by Pissarro, Cezanne and Gauguin, all of whom uh, Van Gogh got to know in the two years he was living in Paris before his move to the south of France. But now it's time to leave the countryside and go into town. So over to Miranda to take us into central Paris. Thank you, Ted. And yes, it is, um, it's an interesting departure now to be leaving the French countryside and arriving in Paris. But uh, for all that we associate Impressionism with these sun-drenched landscapes, it was still a movement that uh, was very much centred in Paris. Um, the exhibitions that you've heard about were all held in Paris. Many of these artists maintained a studio or at least visited Paris regularly to see exhibitions. Um, or their dealer who was, would have been based in Paris. So it certainly is, uh, has a strong connection through to the city. But there's also another aspect of city of the city of Paris that I think infuses the works of the Impressionists. And that's an, a response to the fact that Paris, during the decades preceding the emergence of Impressionism, was really undergoing the most extraordinary transformation. Under Napoleon III, the emperor in in France in the um, in this period in the 18 from the 1850s, there was a huge rebuilding of Paris, a modernization project uh, that uh, the emperor entrusted to his prefect of the Seine, Baron Haussmann, and this so-called Haussmannization of Paris involved incredible transformation above and below the surface, if you like. It involved the 
uh, renovation of the sewerage system to create to create a much more clean and sanitary city, which had had many um, you know, bouts of typhoid and cholera across the years, which, of course, um, cost the city very dearly. Uh, it also, um, he also transformed above the ground by raising many of the more um, sort of uh, shambolic me medieval parts of Paris, which were home to many hundreds of thousands of, um, you know, urban poor. He, these areas were uh, cleaned out and in their place, Grand boulevards were put in big apartment buildings, uh, which um, are the the great apartments uh, that we now associate and uh, seem so iconic of Paris. But at this time in the 1870s, this was all very new. Um, Paris had also undergone, uh, been the sort of the site of much conflict, both in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, and then it had witnessed the, the Paris Commune of 1871, in which was a great deal of bloodshed on the streets of Paris itself. So it was a time of huge, um, huge change. Some of the artists were directly affected by that. And we're looking at a wall here um, of paintings featuring the works of Edgar Degas, the two works on the right. In the centre, a great painting by Edouard Manet called The Street Singer. And then on, but next to that, on the left, another Degas and another, and then a work by Mary Cassatt. And I'll come to those last two in a moment. But just to mention Edouard Manet, um, Manet was a very important figure for the Impressionists. He was uh, n did not exhibit in the Impressionist exhibitions, and he would never have called himself an Impressionist. But he was nonetheless regarded by many of the um, the critics of the time as a kind of or almost like a spiritual leader of the Impressionist group. And this was partly through his very interesting approach to, I think, capturing everyday life. I mean, he's commonly kind of referred to as the painter of, of modern life and, and the way we, we now receive his works. He was trying to capture this sense of change in Paris. He was also an artist that was very influenced by art history. And the very fact that the paintings on this in this gallery are so much darker than the works in the neighbouring galleries is a sign of the... Uh, the fashion for and interest in Spanish painting of the 17th century that was um, very much of an influence on Manet and to a, some, a lesser extent Degas. But these um, this sort of mixture of an interest in history but also an interest in reflecting contemporary life, everyday life, is a kind of characteristic that connects Manet through to the Impressionists. So these two smaller paintings that we'll look at in a little more detail, on the right you have Edgar Degas' visit to a museum. And the two figures in this painting are believed to be, st the standing figure is believed to be that of Mary Cassatt and her sister Lydia is seated on the uh, the banquette reading a guidebook. And it's believed that they're in the Italian galleries of the Musée du Louvre. Somebody has identified the painting in the background, in fact, as a Veronese, even though it looks very much like um, a blur of paint. The colours, um, I believe, uh, have led to uh, that definitive description of it as being one of the Italian paintings. Now, Mary Cassatt uh, was a very good friend of Degas. They met uh, in the 1870s. She was a Philadelphian-born painter, so American who came to live in, in France and to get more of an art education after her initial education back in Philadelphia. She ended up living in France for the rest of her life. Uh, she had a small chateau outside of France where she lived um, for many years. She never married, um, but if it's believed that she had a fairly close relationship or friendship with Degas, the exact nature of their relationship isn't really known because um, their correspondence, uh, she destroyed uh, their correspondence before she died. Um, so we don't know very much about them, but we certainly know that they shared a great um, kinship in terms of their approach to painting. When Cassatt first saw some of uh, Degas' pastels in the window of a dealer in Paris. She hadn't yet met the artist, but she saw these pastels and she said, at that, at that moment, my artistic life changed forever. And for his part, when Degas first saw a painting by Mary Cassatt, he said, ah, here is someone who feels as I do. And I think that idea of um, the feeling or the emotion in their paintings is quite complicated. It's a slightly restrained, detached sense of emotion. They're, they're observers of human nature, and I think this comes out very much in their paintings. Mary Cassatt paints, is very famous for her paintings of women and children. She painted fantastic scenes um, of the Paris opera and uh, of women seated in the um, audience 
their taffeta and silk dresses reflecting the lights of the chandeliers in the auditorium and really capturing a sense of the spectacle of the French uh, sort of opera and, and theatre world. She, in this painting, which is actually quite a late painting from 1896, she actually captured her niece, Ellen Mary, who is only a, a mere two-year-old, I think, two, just over two years old, um, here captured wearing this um, rather formal white uh, ensemble, clearly ready to go out into the world. She looks as if like she's trussed up like the Christmas turkey. And I think that uh, the attention to fashion and detail is, is something that Cassatt uh, enjoyed. She herself was a, a client of the House of Worth and enjoyed high fashion. But I think she's also making a reference here to the history of painting. It's like a a little nod, I think, to the paintings of Velasquez and his contemporaries who painted the, the princesses of the Spanish royal court, the Infantas, in their extraordinary bejeweled costumes and their wigs. Uh, this is, I think, a little nod to that. The next gallery of the exhibition actually shows us some more works by Cassatt and Degas. Um, they're works of printmaking, so they, they require a little bit of detailed study, so we won't linger on them for very long, but just a, a reference to the fact that these artists did not only experiment in oil paint, they were very interested in other mediums and printmaking was one that uh, particularly in this group, Camille Pissarro, Edgar Degas and Mary Cassatt all experimented in. It was um, These are prints that they created for an actually unrealized book, uh, which was to be called Le Jour et la Nuit, Day and Night. And it reflects one of the strengths of Boston's collections again, which is that they have several of the preparatory studies or the earlier states of prints to show us a little bit of the printmaker's practice. So that was uh, something that these these uh, these um, prints are um, fantastic at revealing. And this part of the exhibition design is a reference to uh, it makes reference to the the mechanical, if you like, the mechanised process of printmaking with the metal plates uh, on which, of course, the, the image is both rendered, but then, of course, in the printing process, there's a, the, the, the plates of the printers are used as well. And then we shall segue from this gallery to the final gallery of the exhibition, which um, we pass through a, a little interlude of uh, that has a, a reference again to nature and the outdoors before we experience the paintings of Claude Monet in full glory. We have a gallery here of 17 canvases and I'm going to pass again to Ted to introduce some of these works to us. Thanks, Miranda. And this closing gallery of the exhibition is really an exhibition in itself. Uh, just remarkable to have so many works by Monet. And it opens uh, with this beautiful portrait um, of his wife, Camille. And what I found amazing is the story of Monet um, and his family. So we know that after attending art school in Paris in the 1860s, uh, Claude Monet met this lady, Camille Léonie Doncieux, and she became his model and his mistress. But after they had a child out of wedlock in 1867, Monet's father cut off his allowance. So uh, Claude Monet and Camille couldn't afford to live in Paris anymore. So um, they spent... Um, pretty much the rest of their lives um, until the 1890s, before they achieved financial success, or before Monet achieved financial success, uh, moving from one rural location to another outside Paris. Um, they had a second child together uh, before, sadly, Camille died. She passed away from cancer in 1879, leaving Claude Monet a widower with two children. And he was then living in a country town called Viteuil. Then what happened is that his great patron, and collector Ernest Hochiday suddenly went bankrupt. And Ernest asked whether he could move in with Monet and his two kids into Veteuil, where he wouldn't have to pay rent. But he brings with him his wife, Alice, and their um, uh, six children. So suddenly Monet finds himself uh, in a household with um, um, 11 people. Uh, then what happens is that Alice and Ernest uh, separate. Ernest goes back to Paris and Alice becomes Monet's new partner. Um, and uh, Monet is left looking after Alice and eight children, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and I think that um, it was all these little kids that may have led Monet to need to get out of the house every once in a while, perhaps Miranda. <laughs> and that's why he yes. left every year on painting campaigns. So yes, let's see how he escapes the kids. <laughs> 
Yes, well, it's interesting, isn't it, Ted? This is the only painting in this gallery that actually has figures in it um, because I think, yes, as you say, he he made these sort of several months at a time he would go off to different parts of the country to paint uh, a concerted effort and he'd come back with large numbers of works for exhibition. Um, so, the, so clearly he liked to work in that sort of semi-isolation on location, as it were. Um, what this gallery also gets to, invites us to see is some of the places that he really spent sustained periods of time. So the first group of works that we get to look at are three wonderful paintings of that coast in Normandy, the area in which he uh, grew up. Although he had been born in Paris, he really his family moved to Le Havre when he was four years old. So he knew the Normandy coast very well, and he painted many aspects of the of the coast there. It's rocky outcrops, the little fishermen's cottages up on the hillsides. This is a painting called uh, "The Road at La Cave in Pourville, which is one of my favourites in the exhibition, and it's. I, I can't really explain why, except that, I mean, it's it's fascinating to me that you he's painted what is a fairly sort of un, un, unremarkable scene in the sense that it's this little goat track going down to the beach. There are some trees. There's no, you know, central grand monument to take our attention, but it draws us in. And then once we've been drawn in, the quality of the paintwork is, is just so beautiful. The colours in the flowers and the grasses on either side of the path. It's almost like a, a, the whole spectrum is there, but it creates this wonderful sense of movement across the canvas. You almost sense the sea breeze blowing up there. And it's just it's transporting. And I think it does help us understand what Monet meant when he said that he didn't seek to render the motif in his paintings, meaning he didn't he wasn't trying to accurately capture a thing in his paintings. What he wanted was to capture what lay between the motif and himself. So he's really talking about all of those things that come into play when you're looking at something intently, and that's, you know, your own position in relative to what you're looking at, your own body and its responses to what you're looking at, and, of course, your mind and all of your emotions that pass through in this moment of experience and perceptual experience and embodied perceptual experience, which is, I think, what kept Monet kind of so committed to painting and being so productive as he kept, you know, kept on painting for so many decades. The next group of paintings that help us, I think, see this, I get understand this idea even more, are four beautiful scenes painted uh, in the Medi on the Mediterranean coast in the 1880s. And it's four paintings that he painted during an extended sojourn there between January and May, um, three of them anyway, were painted um, in 1888, including this wonderful picture of um, Antibes. And this is the a uh, fort in Antibes, so it's part, a sort of very identifiable part of the the town of Antibes in on the Mediterranean. It's in the middle distance. It's a bit like reminds me a little of the painting of Venice in that the the monument is in the middle ground, and then you have this large expanse of sky and the snow capped mountains, and in the foreground the choppy water. This was the time uh, from winter through spring that in the south of France often experiences very strong winds, the Mistral, which um, come across the across the coastline there and are very cold. And in these paintings, you get a sense of the kind of almost clear, that very crisp, clear light, but also a very different quality of light, light to the north of France. The paintings of, of the Mediterranean are very pinky blue, and it's uh, nice to read the writings of Monet to back to Alice. Uh, he was writing on an almost daily basis, letters home and describing his work. And he wrote in one of them in 1888, he said, it's so beautiful here, so bright, so luminous. One swims in blue air and it is frightening. I think that he did find capturing these this emotion quite challenging. It was the constant effort, um, and he it wasn't an easy practice for him. So it's a, even though they look so masterful, I think each work was this you know a feat really to to create. There's one painting in this group of four that's actually a little bit earlier. It's from 1884, and we'll look at that one next. It's um, another painting of the coast, the, the Mediterranean coast. It's Cap Martin near Monton. It's painted in 1884. And I'm just drawing attention to this one because it reminds us, I think Ted was referring to the visit that Van Gogh made to Paris in 1886, where he was able to experience Monet's work in detail at the George um, Petit Gallery. 
And this painting shows us, I think, something about what what maybe Van Gogh was so inspired by when he looked at Monet's paintings. You can see in the paintwork here really quite loose strokes in the in the clouds that are obscuring the mountain in the background, in the furrows of the clay rich soil in the foreground, and in those trees. I think we can see that Van Gogh, you know, was very inspired by these paintings and I can see the trace of them when you look at the paintings that he made in the south of France in the olive groves or in the cypresses. So that's just a, a fantastic kind of connection again between these artists. Now the last wall of this gallery, uh, it's a curved wall but it's a, it's full of paintings of Giovanni and I'm going to pass to Ted again to take us through some of those. Yeah thanks Brandon. So the, the closing section of the show tells us the story of how Monet settled in Giverny. It's a small town that was 70 kilometers northwest of Paris, and he moved there with Elise and the eight kids in 1883. And it's there that finally in 1891, um, he and Elise are allowed to get married. Elise will not marry him until her um, husband, Ernest Hochaday, has passed away. So not only does Monet finally celebrate his long relationship through marriage with Elise, but in 1890, at last, his paintings are selling enough for him to buy a home for the first time. So that's really important. And uh, it's from 1890 to 91 that Monet painted the first of his, what will become his monumental series. And this is one of them. It's a group of pictures representing wheat stacks uh, in the fields near his home. And he exhibited 15 of these in Paris at the durand Ruel Gallery to critical acclaim and commercial success. The show is a complete sellout and that's sold for very high prices. And we know from letters written at the time, particularly by his great friend Camille Pissarro, what an extraordinary impact this had, because you would think that just showing the same subject might 15 times might be monotonous, but Monet made it anything but. He showed the haystack um, in autumn, winter, summer and spring. He showed it at dawn, uh, noon and dusk. He showed it in burning sunlight, in mist, in pelting rain and in the snow. And in this beautiful scene um, on loan from Boston, we see the haystack um, or the wheat stack uh, on a crisp winter's morning coated with a light dusting of snow. Now, thanks to the success of this show and then subsequent shows from this point onwards, Monet basically sold everything he painted at high prices. He's able to buy a second property at Giverny and join the two together. And then he's able to move in um, a team of landscape um, architects um, and gardeners, and he's able to excavate his great water lily ponds and build his remarkable Japanese bridge across one of them that's still there at Giverny today. So the show closes with one of these iconic views of his Japanese bridge, which is just a quintessential late Monet, um, absolutely breathtaking in its use of colour. And you can see the beginnings of virtual abstraction in this work. Um, here, um, as Miranda mentioned, you know, he said that the motif wasn't as important as as what lay between his eyes and the motif. And here, what's important is the colour and the way he's manipulated uh, the pigment um, with uh, his brush, uh, the hairs of his brush with the back end of his brush and also sometimes even with his fingers. So the technique of painting is now as much a subject as uh, the scene that's being represented in late Monet's work. The show closes with one of his beautiful immersive pictures showing his water garden at Giverny where he planted his beloved water lilies or nénuphar as they call them in French and Monet exhibited 48 of these water landscapes as he called them in 1909 and um, the critics then were absolutely fascinated by their wonderful fusion of solid forms and diaphanous reflections and they now compared Monet's paintings to poetry and music and you get a sense here that we, the viewer, are almost like a dragonfly hovering above this incredible watery surface. Uh, there's no horizon line. We don't know where this landscape begins or ends. We're simply part of it ourselves. So Monet has created something incredibly experiential here. And the design of this closing gallery has been made an experiential um, happening, as it were, in homage to Monet. Miranda would like to um, share with us of the reasoning behind this. Thank you, Ted. Yes, I think we'll, well, now that we're all like 
like dragonflies hovering over the the floor plan of the exhibition. You can see that it's an oval gallery, which was a deliberate reference to the gallery in Paris that Monet helped to design uh, in a year before he died in 1926. The galleries at the uh, Musée de l'Orangerie, uh, which had these oval walls on which he placed his water lily, wonderful wide water lily landscapes, really the, the enormous panoramas of water landscapes that do have this uh, unfinishing or, un, or sort of unending surface that uh, are very much, as Ted mentioned, sort of the, 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 the high point, if you like, of Monet's career, but also the reference point for so much in 20th century painting that comes after with this sort of idea of the surface becoming everything in the painting. And that's why we wanted to make that reference at the end here and allow our visitors to have this sort of panorama of the works of Monet. So that is where we leave, uh, leave the artist of Impressionism with this wonderful focus on Monet. But at the same time, while we have gotten to see so much work by Monet, we've seen works by so many other artists that all together create the extremely interesting and quite complex story of Impressionism, but which I think I think most will agree, will leave us with the sense of just this extraordinary visual beauty. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed your virtual visit. Thanks again to our corporate partners, and especially the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and their curatorial staff in particular. Please visit our website, ngv.melbourne, to explore the virtual tour of this exhibition and many more. We look forward to welcoming you back to the gallery soon.